Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShadowRelics.com. I hope you're all doing well out there. I hope you're all staying healthy. I hope things are moving in a positive direction for you because we need a lot of positivity right now. Today we're gonna talk about one of the prettiest pieces that I've bought in a while. We were at, up north recently and I walked across a room and wow, I see this. And I'm like, that is so beautiful. <laughs> I need to have that. And so we're gonna talk about it a little bit. Before the war, there were a lot of small, uh, and some of them not so small, uh, militia regiments for states, local governments, and they all had their own uniform. A lot of times those uh, cities or towns had a lot of money, so they had really fancy uniforms. This is one of those early pre-war uh, uniforms that you run across, and it's probably 1830s. How do we know that? We know that mainly by the construction of the coat and also uh, by the buttons. Buttons are oftentimes what gives us that first clue what we're looking at. When you look at a button, you, you, the first place that I look when I see a uniform is the thread. Because if that thread has been on there for all, with this being 1830s, almost 200 year old coat, that thread should look like 200 year old thread. It won't be the little thin stuff you buy at Walmart. It will be old, thicker, it will have that age and you'll be able to see that that button was set in there because if you can make a coat like this, you are a heck of a tailor and they will be really nice and tight, uh, but you gotta be careful. They also are fragile. <laughs> We've all done it. If you're in the business, sometimes you will be buttoning up a coat and you will pop that thread and it will fly across the room and uh, it's horrible. So be careful, but look at the thread on the coat. During the Civil War, most all of the buttons that you see are two or three piece construction is what they're referred to. Meaning that a two piece button, you'll have the dome of the button and then you'll have a back. Early buttons generally just have the dome and the earlier ones will be completely flat, but they'll have a dome and the shank soldered uh, onto the center of the back of the button. These uh, are marked by R&W Robinson in Attleboro, Massachusetts, huge button manufacturer, and they made really, really quality pieces. Uh, they were in business only until 1848 or 49. I should have made that note and I didn't, but they were 1848, 1849 at the latest. But by then they were doing the multiple piece constructions. Um, these buttons are for an artillery. And we know that because it has the Union Eagle on the front. And as I tell you many times, the Union Eagle has the arrows of war in one hand, the branch of peace in the other. And in the center of the uh, eagle's chest, it has a shield. And on the shield, we have an A that lets us know it's uh, the artillery branch of service. You can know that this one is artillery from a mile away because of the red trim. Red has always been uh, the color of artillery. Blue is for infantry. Uh, gold is for cavalry. Green is for medical service. So we know from a distance what type of uniform. And a lot of those local militias, it did mix up. Early coats like this that were used later on caused a lot of trouble when the war broke out. Because like at First Manassas, you had Union soldiers in gray uniforms because it's what they had when the war broke out. Because <laughs> back then, never thought it would be into such a, div I even hate to use the word divisive. I started to use it and I thought, well, hell, I've heard that so much lately, I don't wanna use it. But <laughs> the uh, North and South both had uh, uh, gray uniforms. A lot of the Southern guys wore blue uniforms. The guys, the Richmond uh, blues out of, uh, or there, there were a lot that were wearing both colors at the early days of the war. This one's go is gonna date about 1830. It has the beautiful, triple row of buttons on the front. One thing you like to see on an early coat, look how tall that collar is. It's so tall they don't even use a cuff button for the ornamentation on the collar. It's big enough they use a coat button and they see that a lot. They've even got four coat buttons on the cuff. I mean, 
that's an ornate coat. And check the back of it out. I'm not going to flip it around, so we're going to use a picture. Look at the back of that coat. It has the swallowtail design, more coat buttons. And these buttons today run you anywhere from $30 to $60 a piece. So it adds up really quickly. Uh, you can see on the shoulders, like this, at one time it would have had epaulets. And epaulets just dress pieces for the shoulders, make the guy look a little bigger. Always reminds me of the 1980s. God, I miss them. The 1980s uh, with the shoulder pads for the ladies. Uh, if you like designing women and golden girls, you see them all the time. And, but it's just a great coat. It's early coat, 1830s, 1840s, because later on they phase out these buttons. Because all that's holding that button in place is that little bit of solder uh, onto the center of the back of the button like this. You can see there, that's how it works. But it's a, it's a great coat. It's beautiful. It does have the gray. And if you see it from a distance, a lot of people will be like, oh, that's a Confederate coat. Nope, it's early. And that happens a lot. And a lot of times you'll actually, not one with this many buttons because it would cost you a, a, a bloody fortune to get these buttons off and put Confederate buttons on. But some of them that have just a few buttons down the front, a lot of times you'll see where unscrupulous people will put Confederate buttons down them and try to pass them as Confederate. Nope, they're early. Uh, a coat like this should be all hand sewn. There's no machine stitching on this coat because the first sewing machine patent was, I think 1851, 52, 53, right through there. So hand sewn tall collar, buttons, button makers, because uh, they did still make uh, buttons for a long time. So you need to check that back mark, that maker's mark on the back. Uh, size. I'm not a little guy, but this fit a little guy. And you got to remember 200 years ago, we didn't have good health care. We didn't have uh, doctors everywhere. The guys didn't eat as well. So they're a lot smaller. You got to remember that. And a lot of times they're little bitty fellas. <laughs> That's why guys like George Washington and Andrew Jackson that were massive people and, and tall people stood out so much is because most people were this size. Okay. Uh, we just had the election and it's still getting counted. Personally, it did not go the way that I had hoped it would. Uh, or that I thought it would, but there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, <clears throat> I am of, a, of an opinion, and I try to keep my opinions to myself because I never want to be the person that steers you wrong because I have never walked on water. I did not yesterday, probably will not today. Uh, but I do believe one thing, and I'll leave it alone because <laughs> there are bigger minds than mine that think about it all the time. If I write you a check, or you write me a check and we take it to the bank and the bank is what's important because that's where the money's at. That check, they might know one of us, but they don't know the other. We have to use a identification and we have to use a thumbprint to cash that check. Why? Because that bank wants to be sure everybody is who everybody is. That is not asking too much. It should be the same way to be able to vote. Because uh, if I have to show an ID to buy a beer and to cash a check, that is a lot less important than deciding who's going to lead our country for at least four years. I hope that I am wrong. I am wrong on a regular basis. And I hope that these are the most prosperous next four years that our country has ever had because we need it. Uh I will keep a good thought. I'm so proud that of all the votes that were cast and all the votes that I don't think were cast that our country has not rioted. It says a lot about a lot of people that have had horrible things said about them over the last four years. Nothing has been burned. Nobody has had their property destructed. It's it's a very interesting time to be alive in America. Uh, I'll leave it at that. I hope that you guys are well. I hope that you're all moving forward because as my buddy Larry Hicklin taught me years and years ago, doesn't matter what you did to get in the position that you are today. Look at where you're at and look at what move will make 
the thing, the situation better. Because you can't change what's past. You can learn from it and go forward, but you can't change the past. I hope you guys are doing well. Uh, and I love you guys. Catch you next time.